constipation. Nobody wants it, but everyone seems to have it. We have a love-hate relationship with constipation and acute care. We hate it for all of the obvious reasons. It's painful, it's never-ending, it's frustrating because there's no easy fix and expectations usually don't match reality in the ED. We love it because we want to blame everything on it to everyone's peril. Today, we'll talk about the dangerous pitfalls in constipation, its unchecked complications, and some real-world advice on how to clean up this mess. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. There are all kinds of complicated definitions for constipation, but it boils down to this. You don't like how much or how often your bowels move. More formally, the North American and European societies of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition define constipation as this. In the absence of another organic pathology... Two or more of these criteria should be present. Two or less defecations per week. History of stool retention. Hard or painful stools. Large fecal mass in the rectum. Large caliber stools that may obstruct the toilet. Or fecal incontinence. Children will often have irritability, decreased appetite, early satiety. Constipation often presents as frequent recurring episodes of mild abdominal pain that resolves between episodes. The truth is, the bell-shaped curve of normal bowel movements is so wide that I just tell parents this. How often your child poops is not the problem. Pain and hard stools are. When they come to us, parents may already know what the problem is, especially in the younger child. They come to you with a detailed knowledge of their child's bowel movements. They're frustrated with what they've already tried, and they want you to fix it now in the ED. In older children, parents may bring them in simply because of pain. They may have their suspicions of what may be causing it, but what blows everyone's mind are two things. A. This belly pain has been going on forever and no one can tell them what it is. And B, it is very painful and maybe increasingly so. A constipated preschooler or school-aged child is miserable. Also in toilet-trained children, most parents are not checking the toilet and so they may not have a detailed idea of what's happening. But they may add in their own interpretation. So when people come to us with constipation, we're already enlisted in a losing battle, but expected to deliver victory immediately. Our first obligation, is it really constipation and why? We don't want to assume this is simply functional constipation. It's tempting because about 90% of the time, that is just what it is. But we're not here for what grandma could diagnose. We have to remain alert and ask the right questions. The red flags for constipation secondary to another condition are ribbon stools, fever, bilious vomiting, severe abdominal distension, failure to thrive, and any neurologic signs or symptoms like decreased lower extremity tone or reflexes, a sacral dimple, or a tuft of hair on the spine. More on that soon. Remember that constipation and urinary tract infections are evil twins. Consider one when you consider the other. You're trying to make sure that into your conscious mind floats the differential diagnosis, if only for a fleeting moment, so we don't blow off the child with celiac disease, hypothyroidism, botulism, Hirschsprung's disease, pseudo-obstruction, a pelvic teratoma, or spina bifida occulta. 
we do a complete physical exam. The full list is in the show notes. Now, I don't have to preach to you how humbling our job is when people who have poor access to care don't follow up or they use the ED as their main source of health care and advice. Sometimes we're the only ones that will have the opportunity to pick up on something life-changing for good or for bad. Now, of course, you can't work up everyone for everything. It's a balance. Let's assume you did all of that. Your differential diagnosis is low-key, lit, yeet, 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 straight fire bet. It's not sus, and for reals, y'all, this kid is backed up. The kid may seem bloated, lose his appetite, hide in a corner when it's time to use the toilet, or just be terribly cranky all of the time. And that's just the teenagers. More seriously, the approach to functional constipation depends on age because, well, an infant functions very differently than, say, a toddler or school-aged child or adolescent. Let's go through a series of cases to apply core concepts to troubleshoot what the parents are going through so we can get that child cleaned out. Aaliyah is a three-month-old baby girl born full-term without complications who is brought in by her mother because she's worried that she's backed up. The child has been eating, sleeping, and behaving normally. She's formula-fed three ounces every three to four hours. All seems just fine, except mother has noticed over the past two days that Aaliyah looks very uncomfortable from time to time. After feeding, maybe 20 to 30 minutes later, Aaliyah turns red. She clenches her little fists and grunts. Sometimes she even screams. Mother is very worried that something is very wrong. Usually, the episode ends in a bowel movement that looks normal, but mother's concerned that little Miss Aaliyah is having too much trouble pooping. She has at least one poopy diaper a day, she's urinating normally, and her vital signs and exam are totally normal. She's a happy little cutie in front of you. It's not uncommon for breastfed babies to stool after most feeds, and the mean number is three per day. Formula-fed babies defecate less frequently, one to two times per day. The frequency of bowel movements decreases with age, and toddlers will poop once a day or once every other day. Of course, in Aaliyah's case, you think of all the terrible medical and surgical things that she could be at risk for, but... After listening, asking follow-up questions, examining her, you feel comfortable that poor little Miss Aaliyah is suffering from infant dyskesia, not constipation. Infant dyskesia is just a fancy medical term for you try pooping while lying flat. You've seen this before and nothing is wrong. No change in intake is needed, just reassurance. Infant dyskesia happens in children less than nine months of age, usually in the two to six month crowd, and it's typical to see the poor baby strain and strain and strain for up to 10 minutes at a time, usually then successfully stooling. We think that infant dyskesia comes from the developing coordination between increasing intradominal pressure and relaxing that pelvic floor. Babies, like anyone, feel fullness in the colon and quickly learn to react to the urge to push. The problem is, is that the urge to push and learning how to deal with it happens before they learn how to relax their pelvic floor. So they're pushing up against a barricade. Not to worry, nature will win here. Usually the baby learns to coordinate within a few weeks and no testing or treatment is needed, just some education and follow-up. Jake is a 10-month-old baby boy with no past medical history who was brought in by his mother because she's worried he hasn't pooped in over five days. This doesn't seem to bother him that much. She does say that after meals, he sometimes strains and cries, and that his stool is often hard or pellet-like. 
You probe a little further, and he's actually stooling for the past two days, but like a rabbit. For some reason, gastroenterologists love to compare everything to our favorite foods. So you've been warned. The scale goes from 1 to 7 and goes from hardest to softest. Type 1 stool. Separate hard clumps like nuts. They're difficult to pass and can be black. Type 2. Sausage-shaped but lumpy. Type 3. Like a sausage but with cracks on the surface. Type 4. Like a sausage or snake, smooth and soft. This is average stool. Type 5. Soft blobs with clear-cut edges. Type 6. Fluffy pieces with ragged edges, a mushy stool. Type 7. Watery, no solid pieces, and entirely liquid diarrhea. Based on what Jake's mother has told us so far, what Bristol type would this be? She described it like rabbit pellets, so that would be type 1, separate hard lumps like nuts. This is the hardest stool that you can pass. Now, you may think, well, he has been pooping for the past two days now. It can't be that bad. But Jake is constipated for sure. Remember, you can stool every day and still be constipated. The question now is, why is he constipated? As we mentioned, constipation is multifactorial, but in this case, we can narrow down the likely causes because of his age and how well he otherwise functions. Jake is 10 months old. That means he eats, sleeps, poops, pees, and crawls. He may be pulling to standing and he may cruise from time to time, but he's not doing any CrossFit. So activity is out as a modifier. He should be eating finger foods and taking free water. So let's explore that a little bit. You dig a little deeper and find there's a lot of stress going on in the house. Both parents work, his aunt takes care of him, and it's a busy household with other children. And Jake ends up eating a lot of things that he loves, but don't necessarily love him back. He has the typical chicky nugget cheese stick banana chaser diet that is really backing him up. Gastroenterologists will have different opinions on how diet affects constipation symptoms, how constipation can be triggered, and what may or may not help to treat it. All would agree that a diet poor in fiber, rich in fats, and certain constipation triggering items definitely sets the stage. Once the problem is established, simply adopting a perfect diet doesn't universally fix constipation. Here, the key is prevention, of course, but unfortunately, most of our job is picking up the pieces of collateral damage after the fact. So, yes, Jake does need a menu makeover. Typically, constipating foods are everything that infants and toddlers love. Here are the usual suspects. Fast food, fried food, processed foods. So that means hamburgers, hot dogs, chips, chicken nuggets. Who knows what's in those, really? Bread and rice. Bananas and cheese are also big culprits. The proteins in milk or formula may be a problem as well. The list goes on, but I find that those are the frequent offenders. Also, basically anything processed, dehydrated, or fatty. One helpful rule of thumb is, if your grandmother or great-grandmother wouldn't recognize it from her childhood, then best to stay away. Foods that prevent constipation are anything with high water content and natural insoluble fiber, like pears, apples, berries, vegetables, any of them. Whole grains are fine. Oatmeal is great. It's a great way to stay regular. Lentils, black beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, all of those have great fiber. In children three or older, popcorn is a wonderful way to keep up the fiber content and add bulk. Just remember that children less than three years of age should not be given anything that requires fine chewing. They're just not coordinated enough to to trust them not to aspirate. The list goes on, and you can definitely hand your patient a handout, but it's nice to have a few things to talk about off the top of your head. Probably the most important thing is enough water. That can be mostly in the food itself. 
watermelon or other melons are great. Making the oatmeal just a little runnier helps too. Any way to introduce large amounts of water in the diet just help things go down better. What I tell parents is this. If your body doesn't get enough water or hydration, the last chance it has to steal it is from your colon, the end of your intestine. That dries out your poop and makes it hard to stool. If you give your intestines all the water they could ever want, your poop is hydrated, soft, and easy to pass. This seems to get that visual through. Water in, soft out. A quick take-home for toddlers is to add purees of the four P foods. Prunes, pears, peaches, and papayas. A nice, natural, gentle way to get things regular. So that brings us back to how to help poor Jake. Well, a new diet will take some time for the family to adapt to, and Jake is starting to suffer now. It's a big deal for a family to rethink their routine. And once you start talking about something as personal and intimate as what you eat and what you don't, people get very defensive. Start with the positives. Oatmeal is a great addition to get water and fiber in. Add the good stuff so that de-emphasizing and phasing out the bad stuff is not so abrupt and painful. Another good toddler rule of thumb is to give them something familiar and offer one new thing at a time. One familiar, one new. Too much new all at once, and you may have a stalemate. Dietary counseling is essential, but it's often not enough. We have to help Jake start to have normal bowel movements, maintain that normality, and then maybe back off on medical treatment. You gotta push the boat out of the mud first. Praying for rain will only get you so far. So that means something to boost the liquid content of the stool. The modern first-line agent is polyethylene glycol 3350, commonly known as Miralax, the miracle laxative, and that is what it is. Miralax is an osmotic agent. Polyethylene glycol is not absorbed in the gut, so it sits there and pulls water from the contents of the stool as well as from the gut lining to bulk up and hydrate the stool, making passage more efficient. There's a catch. As an osmotic agent, it only works if there's enough water content around. Sometimes we all hear what we want to hear, and of course, sometimes the message received is, here, this medicine will fix it without any other context. Even if you stress the need for water, well, you do mix Miralax powder and water and juice, so that should be enough, right? Jake will be okay, and his presentation is mild, but right now is a teachable moment. You can prevent a whole lot of misery when he's older if you intervene now. Education, support, and a ticket at a constipation station So the first pitfall with Miralax is not increasing the amount of water or liquid in the diet along with the treatment throughout the day. The second big pitfall is not using a disimpaction dose before you start the standard maintenance dose. When you hear disimpaction, you may have dark, terrifying imagery sprout up. Of course, you can disimpact from below, but in children, it's preferred to disimpact from above, by mouth. It's more natural, less anxiety-inducing, and more likely to be adhered to. Normally, the dose of Miralax for maintenance is 0.2 to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, with a maximum daily dose for maintenance of 17 grams per day. It's pretty straightforward, what we usually think of as a Miralax dose, mixed with water, ideally in the AM, and you're good. The disimpaction dose of Miralax, though, is two to three times the maintenance dose. So, you should disimpact with one to one and a half grams per kilo per day. Remember, this is ideal body weight. Up to a hundred grams per day. That's six times the total daily dose for maintenance. 
you give this disimpaction dose for a week, typically three to five days, have yourself a nice clean out and go to the maintenance dose. This regimen is the one endorsed by both the European and North American Societies for Pediatric Enterology. You have to warn the parents that there may be some bloating, some gas, and even discomfort. But the higher the water content of the meals, the better. Jake gets his disimpaction over three days, and a phone check a week later, he's a happier kid. Brianna is a four-year-old girl with no past medical history who was brought in by her grandmother because she's having terrible abdominal pain. It's been going on for the past few months, and Grandma knows the drill. She tells you from the get-go that my grandbaby is terribly constipated, doctor, and needs more help. Mother is working two jobs, and grandmother is her primary caretaker. Grandma really wanted to give an enema, but mother is against it. After a little bit of a dust-up at home between them, Grandma is here to get this settled and hoping you'll side with her. Brianna is doing great. She's growing, she's learning, she's doing well. No red flags. Her vital signs and exam are normal. Her last bowel movement was four days ago. In the room, though, she starts to squirm again and cry. There she goes again, doctor. Can we just get that enema? You try to get a little more info. They've seen other doctors and have been on and off Marillax. Grandma is not having it and thinks it doesn't work. Brianna's diet is terrible. Lots of fast food and processed foods. It's another long talk. You try to find some common ground with Grandma. She has her agenda and she's eyeing you, waiting for you to show your cards so that she can lay down hers. Time to start from where you both will agree. You know, ma'am, you've got a whole lot of experience, much more than many people in this building. She's listening. You know what they say, there are three things that you can't make a child do if they don't want to. That's eat, poop, and sleep. Grandma cracks a smile. You've opened the door to a discussion. It turns out, the social stressors in the house are considerable, and poor Brianna is exerting her little authority with a lot of stool hoarding behavior. When you trace it back, her recurrent abdominal pain and bouts of constipation started when grandmother began toilet training Brianna. It's one of the most common causes of functional constipation. Another longer talk. So, we have to work with people. Medicines work a little like Tinkerbell. You got to believe. If Miralax is a non-starter, that's okay. It is the most modern and safest approach, but it's not the only one that works. Enemas, though, are way down that list. But you can give the child something else to disimpact from above. Lactulose. Before Miralax took over as the go-to, Lactulose was a first-line agent. It's better used as a maintenance therapy, but you can use it for a slow disimpaction. The maintenance dose of lactulose is 1.5 to 3 mLs per kilo per day, which can be given daily or divided BID. So you're getting up to 3 mLs per kilo daily. The disimpaction dose of lactulose is 2 mLs per kilo BID, so 4 mLs per kilo daily for up to 7 days for disimpaction. Now, these regimens are too finicky to remember off the top of your head. They're in Harriet Lane or your favorite reference and in the show notes. Lactulose works very well. Sometimes a little too well, and it ends up to have a little more flatulence and abdominal cramping than Miralax, so just be sure to warn parents. Both of these drugs are osmotic agents, and as we mentioned, you need to hydrate that stool. Okay, ma'am, let's try lactulose. No, doctor, we've tried that. You're getting the feeling that grandma is withholding a little from you as well. Not uncommon in someone who doesn't feel that they've been heard. Okay, so what would be the next in line? Well, those truly are the two best options for oral disimpaction. Other meds we'll mention are good at maintenance dosing, but disimpaction dosing can be tough. 
it's a rare thing, but sometimes we admit preschool to school age children for a bowel clean out with Go Lightly via NG tube. I do my best to avoid enemas in children in general and definitely in the ED. Children get what's called anally defensive, and that can reinforce the withholding behavior or get the family hooked on the idea of all enemas all the time, and the child becomes conditioned to need it to have a bowel movement. Again, bad practice, both physiologically and psychologically. After hearing her out and you're explaining the time course of meds and what to expect and when, Grandma is open to trying out an oral disimpaction regimen. You stress the need to check in with her pediatrician, and it feels like a win. Now, you may be thinking, that's a whole lot of talk, and nobody has time for that in a busy ED. And that's true. We're not going to fix this here and now. You may not have the opportunity to have every part of this discussion with every patient every day, but you may need parts of it from time to time. There's always some added value that we can offer in the ED. If you look for it, every encounter could benefit from one little nugget that the patient or family needs. You can be selective with what that biggest take-home for the day is. The earlier the intervention and constipation, the better. When the child is impacted and hoarding, the rectum becomes dilated and floppy, creating a vicious cycle of impaction and the inability to coordinate a bowel movement. The more distended the colon is, the less sensation it has, and the less the child feels the need to defecate. What's worse is that the muscular layers lose strength when stretched. It takes months for the rectum to return to its normal caliber and function, which is why I always end my discussions with the expectation, it's taken a long time to get to this point. It will take at least as long to get you better. Stick with it and you'll see results. Now, that's the altruistic reason to take a few extra minutes with frustrated patients and families. The more self-serving reason is that it actually saves you time and grief. If you don't spend the time needed, you'll probably be ordering a bunch of labs and other studies that they do not need. And of course, it'll take an hour to get back, two hours, three hours. Then you've taught the family that they need to come in for tests every time and they're back again and you're worse off than when you started. An extra five or ten minutes in education will reap its reward. Marcus is a 10-year-old boy with no past medical history other than obesity who comes to the ED with abdominal pain. It feels like another 20 questions game until you get to the part where you find that the parents aren't actually worried about the unknown. The situation is very well known. They want help with their constipation. I emphasize this fact because, again, we don't want to be fooled and attribute every medical and surgical emergency as just constipation. But on the other hand, we don't want to subject children to all kinds of iatrogenia with tests and radiation and invasive procedures when they just need a large dose of humanity and a larger dose of laxative. Okay, back to Marcus. The family is here now not just for the constipation, but for the frustration of it all coming to a head. It turns out Marcus is being bullied at school and the bullying got much worse when he couldn't make it to the toilet on time and soiled himself at school. The family is at their wits end and they're worried that now he has diarrhea on top of his constipation. You may think, hmm, alternating constipation diarrhea, maybe this is irritable bowel syndrome or early inflammatory bowel disease. Both present slightly different in children. Irritable bowel syndrome is 
more common in adults, and inflammatory bowel disease in children usually has a, a long, indolent, vague course of non-GI complaints like arthralgias or rashes before the full-on IBD. Marcus takes constipation meds, PRN, not consistently. When you ask about his bowel movements, he sheepishly looks to his mother, who answers for him. You very politely ask, when was the last time you saw his bowel movement? Blank stare. It's a typical pitfall. Parents of toilet-trained children will assume or fill in the blanks. This is why it's important not to ask people if they're constipated. If you're not in love with your bowel movements, you'll say yes. Ask instead, how often are you pooping? Do you ever clog the toilet? Is there a lot of pain? Do you have to strain? Is there blood? Marcus says yes to most of these. It looks like what they're calling diarrhea is really watery stool making its way around a hardened fecal mass sitting in that rectum. What do we call this? Encopresis. Yep, another variant of the misery of constipation. The family is worried, and what about an x-ray or an ultrasound, doctor? As we know, abdominal x-rays for constipation have gone the way of the dodo bird. It's a really outdated practice and potentially harmful. You're going to find, I don't know, stool. Is that the cause of the abdominal pain? Well, the x-ray is really only going to tell you four things. Is there perforation, ileus, obstruction, or a foreign body? And not all that reliably in all cases. This is a clinical diagnosis, and you know that you got to get that poop ball out. Now, you may think, rectal disimpaction, it's what we may do in the elderly, and the pathophysiology there is different. The elderly really do need a rectal disimpaction. In children, it's almost never needed. But it does bear saying that the child with chronic constipation does not need a rectal exam every time he comes in but he should have gotten at least one once in the past because part of our red flags, is there a presacral mass? Does he have rectal stenosis? In babies and younger children, is this a malpositioned anus? Nope, nope, none of that here. Marcus needs a clean out over the course of the week, but as soon as you start to talk about Miralax, daggers form in the mother's eyes. What did you just stumble into? Mother is convinced that the one time she gave him Miralax when he was seven was what caused him to have behavioral problems and difficulty in school. She's convinced that he has ADHD now and it's all Miralax's fault. Whoa. A lot to unpack and on second thought, let's not unpack that. We're going to pick our battles today. It's true that constipation does have a major behavioral component and it's also not true that Miralax causes this. And if you've never heard of this controversy, then thank your lucky stars, but I'll touch on it so that when you do hear it, you're not blindsided. I won't lead you down a rabbit hole, but the gist is this. Google plus polyethylene glycol search equals OMG. My doctor is giving my baby antifreeze. Antifreeze and radiators is ethylene glycol, a toxic liquid that gives you renal failure and fluorescent urine. Miralax is polyethylene glycol, which is a powder that needs to be reconstituted in water. It's not absorbed. In fact, the package shows an absorption of less than 0.28% with everything else being fecal excretion. PEG is also safely found in toothpaste and creams and all kinds of things that we use every day safely. Now, we do live in a plastic world and we do absorb tiny amounts of things that we're exposed to or eat. Not to freak you out, but we are part of our environment and what we surround ourselves with. The problem is that there are neuropsychiatric issues that arise in young children without a great explanation. And it's human nature to find meaning and explanation. It's similar to the vaccine autism conspiracy theory. Now, while vaccines are essential, Miralax is not, so we'll pick our battles. 
Miralax is out, at least at this point, if you want to survive your shift. Lactulose is not their favorite either. Another option exists. Again, a tried and true remedy. And Marcus just so happens to be mature enough to take it. Mineral oil. It can also be used as a disimpaction agent or a maintenance med. Of course, we do not give it to young children because if they resist your giving it to them or they spit it out or aspirate it, you can give them terrible lipoid pneumonia. Marcus's parents like the idea of an organic, pasture-raised, BPA-free, old-timey remedy, and you think, now is our chance to choose the one message you'd like the family to get out of today's visit. Hmm, so many to choose from. Probably the biggest thing is to talk to Marcus directly. After all, he's the one dealing with this and he is 10 years old. Marcus, we're going to help you out, but you have to take charge. You have to train yourself to go when you feel the urge. Big eyes look back at you. It's so common. Children refuse to defecate at school or in public or nowadays during their marathon sessions playing video games or watching TV. The message today is to listen to your gut when you need to go. It's important to stress that there's no quick fix to constipation. After the clean out, long term changes in diet, medication, and behavior have to be carried out for months or you will go right back to that vicious cycle that got you here. Just a few things about other tools in our tool belt. Milk of magnesia. A good choice for adolescents or adults. You don't want to get it to infants as they can develop magnesium poisoning. Same goes for magnesium hydroxide, not for infants. Fine to use in adults, just caution in the little ones. Let's talk stimulant laxatives. Senna works well, but really is a third line agent and for maintenance. You don't want peristalsis against an impacted stool ball. Bisocodyl is in that same category. Both Senna and Bisocodyl can cause dependence, so some children won't be able to get weaned off of them. So stimulant laxatives for children are an option, but only after everything else has been truly exhausted. Glycerin suppositories are okay for little babies who may be constipated, but don't be fooled by infant dyskesia, which is normal. Also, again, we try not to use rectal therapies if we can avoid them. Which brings us finally to enemas. They're a last resort, but they do have their place. The most important thing to remember is to use the age-appropriate enema. The safest thing is not to use an enema in a child less than two years of age. It can be dangerous, you haven't given the other therapies a chance, and it's not usually needed in an otherwise healthy child without comorbidities. Phosphate enemas in infants and young toddlers can cause hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, and tetany. Saline enemas are a good alternative if you have it. If you do need to give a phosphate osmotic enema, do so judiciously. For children 2 to 4 years of age, give only half of the 2.25 ounce pediatric enema. For children 5 to 11 years, you can give the full amount of 2.25 ounces. It's really low volume. For children 12 and above, you can give them the adult version. If enema is still your go-to, here are some evidence bases to avoid it in the ED. Friedman et al. in Pediatric Emergency Care did a retrospective cohort study on children diagnosed with constipation in the ED who received an enema. They looked at 3,592 visits over a two-year period. Children who received an enema in the ED for constipation were 1.5 times more likely to return to the ED for the same thing, and when these children returned, they were more likely to receive blood work and diagnostic imaging, and, spoiler, they were still constipated. Enemas do have their place. It's just not first place. Remember, if it took years or months to develop, there is no magic bullet. 
or anima. Here's the last case to bring it all together. Mother brings in her six-year-old son with abdominal pain. She's cradling the boy in her arms, sitting at the edge of her seat, rocking back and forth. The child is silent. She herself isn't very talkative, and before she answers, she looks at you briefly, then stares at the wall to finish her brief responses, still rocking. You're trying to get somewhere with the interview and ask when the pain started. She pauses, tears well up in her eyes. She can barely speak. After giving her a moment and trying to get a sense of what is happening today, she answers, two days, then three weeks, really six months, but really over a year. It's hard to get a sense of his associated symptoms, the frequency, quality, really anything. Both of you are getting a little frustrated as the interview goes on. Then it hits you. You're both talking about two different things. You are trying to figure out what the emergency is, and you're not getting far. She is trying to convey how miserable life has been for her, and she's not getting very far. In times like this, of course, it would help to just let the patient talk about whatever is the most important to them, and you listen intently for some recognizable pattern. The problem is, she seems a bit hesitant to give details, like she doesn't trust doctors or something else that's getting in the way. You actively empathize and tell her and show her in all of your body language that you're here to help. You make some progress. After a long, unproductive, seemingly inconsistent back and forth, you just guess. Has he ever been constipated? The glimmer returns to her eyes. Yes, she seems relieved to be asked. And you find out that really this long saga of abdominal pain coming and going and worrying the family has been constipation all along. Unfortunately, the frustration at the situation outpaced the intervention from the family. She comes to you having tried a few things briefly, seeing different doctors and different EDs and clinics, but now in this emotional state, she just wants it all to be over. The boy looks good. He has no pain currently. His vitals are normal. His exam is normal. His abdominal and genital exams, all normal. You've run through your dangerous differential, but everyone already knows what it is. The misery of constipation. Constipation, as we've mentioned, is multifactorial, it's behavioral, it's dietary, stress-related, expectations, physical activity, and that is just the setup. The harder part is treatment, because there has to be some lasting change, or you'll wind up right where you started from. Maybe no one took the time to explain, or maybe she just has too much going on in her life right now, or who knows, but expectations and reality have not talked to each other in a while. It turns out that mother has not wanted to start medications, and when she did, she finally reluctantly started Miralax once daily for the past week without improvement. So then you're thinking, well, what can I offer? She already has the secret weapon. That is, we need to do a little more diving for specifics. It turns out a few things are not exactly right. The poor kid has already been very constipated before the maintenance dose of Miralax was given. He actually never got a disimpaction dose. Secondly, he doesn't drink much water, and of course, Miralax won't work without it. It's an osmotic agent. And lastly, when you bring up the question of a typical breakfast, lunch, or dinner, oh, he eats soup and vegetables and all the kinds of things she thinks you want to hear. When you ask specifically the menu from yesterday, none of that is included. With some gentle prodding, it turns out that they are very happy with their culture's traditional carb and starch and grease and meat. I mean, make a place at the table for me too. It sounds awesome, just not great for the situation at hand. 
Mother is not willing to cook differently, and that line of discussion just got closed. We're not here to tell people what to do. They know how to live their lives way better than we know how to live their lives. We're here for support, guidance, education, acceptance. We work with what we can. Choosing just one thing to work on, we make an agreement to increase fluid intake consistently throughout the day. She's going to put a big jar on the counter. Maybe she'll send them outside to run around more from time to time. We upgrade the regimen with a disimpaction dose of Miralax of 1.5 grams per kilo per day for three days, more water, and then she can resume her previous prescription for the maintenance dose. It's important to counsel parents that the child should probably stay home for the several days that it can take to clean out. Some pediatricians recommend breaking up the disimpaction schedule over two consecutive weekends. This is no different from a bowel prep for, say, colonoscopy. You want the anal effluent to be clear, like tea or urine. Without a good clean-out, you're setting yourself up for failure. The idea is to clean out that floppy colon and keep it empty with maintenance meds. If you can keep that up for a few months, six months at the very minimum, the colon will shrink and gain its sensation and strength again. It's like stroke rehab for your gut. Okay, well, that was just a clarification on how to take the medication properly, which may be plenty of a win for the day. But what else can we choose as our one pearl, our one take-home message for this visit? What may help the family is to set up routine toilet time. Take advantage of the gastrocolic reflex. After the largest meal of the day, sit the child on the toilet. Make him or her comfortable, maybe with a book for a 5-10 to ten minute poop or no poop. The child's feet should be supported so that the pelvic girdle can relax. Mother liked that idea much better than you're even getting close to commenting on her cooking. She went home satisfied, and you were too. There's a lot going on here, but I think we now have a good working knowledge of how to deal with this common and frustrating complaint. First, don't assume that this is functional constipation and not due to a dangerous primary cause without doing a thorough H&P. Keep calm, listen, 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 and know how to escalate care. Disimpact before you give maintenance. Basically, Find the cause, clean the kid out, and continue the regimen. Cause, clean, and continue. All the rest, you have time to look up. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.